My name is Robert Paul O'Hala, and I'm 64 years old. I've been incarcerated for 22 years for a crime I did not commit. I'm going home, and I go to turn in to go down my father's street towards the beach, and there's four sheriff's cars sitting right in the grass. And I go, whoa. And uh, this officer gets out, he's got a gun pointed at my face, and he says, put your hands up. Now I'm confused. Put my hands up or turn off the truck. Well, I get to the sheriff's department, and I said, what, are you, what am I here for? You know what you're here for? I said, no, I don't. I really don't. Oftentimes, we're focusing in in on them as suspects are very flimsy evidence. It's not real evidence. How he became a suspect to begin with. And it's, you know, pretty flimsy. I mean, just because of this truck. God knows how many of those trucks are out there. Well, the truck was, it's like a light pan. I call it a champagne. Well, being a mechanic, I would have known what color it was. Ten minutes later, they said, we got some people that want to see you. And then I could hear them on the other side, and they said, the officer says, is that him? And they said, one guy said, no. And then all of a sudden, I hear another guy, no, 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 no. Anytime you hear a witness say, that's not the person who I saw, or that's not the person who committed the crime, you really should pay attention to that, because that type of evidence is indicative of innocence. So what they did as an ID procedure was Bob's father came in the next day to pick up his truck and they asked him if he wanted to pick up his tools. And so they start showing him tools out of the truck and he's saying yes, yes, yes. And they show him the hammer and he just automatically says yes. So at some level you've set him up to confirm that all the tools are his. And I mean a hammer's a hammer unless there's really something distinctive about it. Like in this case, jailhouse informants come forward or are approached by the prosecutor or by the cops or whatever, it's when the case is falling apart, when there's a lot of problems with it. And so the jailhouse informant is heaven sent. They're going to answer all of our questions. They're going to solve all of our problems. My name is Jared Millender. I was a jailhouse informant in Robert O'Hala's case, and I was the perfect jailhouse informant. My mom worked for the clerk in the court. I was friends with one of the jurors. My family has deep roots in the county, and you know, I'm a Millender, which in Franklin County is a big name. At that time, I think Mr. Rue, as a state attorney, was pretty desperate to try to find anybody that would get him what he needed to get the conviction on Mr. Ahala. My attorney, which was the public defender at the time, named Kevin Steiger, came to me and told me that the state attorney, Adam Ruiz, I approached him and said that they would give me a lenient deal if I would testify against Bob O'Hala. I told him I didn't really know anything about Bob's case. They told me not to worry about it. They would give me all the information I needed. With a six-person jury, there's social pressure as opposed to, you know, trying to persuade you with facts and evidence. And I was even trying to convince them. They just didn't want to hear it. Like I said, by the like third day, everyone's like, look, I'm done. I want to go home. And, you know, small town like that around here, how much has it happened everywhere else? It was never proven to me 100%, no doubt in my mind, that 
he was there, he did. I said, this is going to get straightened out. It's got to get straightened out. My heart broke when they took me to prison. My brother has always had a big heart. Me and Debbie and Bobby were just like one whole unit that we had to help each other survive in this big world, you know? That's just how it was. I miss that. I miss when we were all three little and we had to stay in the house and we were all together. I wish we would have had him all those other years because he's a very happy person, I mean, in general, and he brightens your life. And, and even when I talk to him on the phone now, you know, he brightens my life. He makes my day. How has that felt with him not being in my life? I mean, I lost my son, um, my only child, and I know he would have been there for me. I lost my husband. I lost so many people, and and I just know that he would have been my rock that I needed. He always tells me, when I get out, I'm going to take care of you. Debbie, I'm praying. I'm praying. You're going to get better. You're going to get better. I hope that he gets out so that me and him and my sister can be the family that we should have been all these years because that's all that's left is me and my sister and my brother and we just want to be a whole family unit again before we all have to say goodbye. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, I love you, El Shaddai, I surely do. By myself I am too, there's nothing I can do without you. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, I love you. Here I am, a humble man, trying to make my final stand. El Shaddai, I'm down on my knees and I'm begging you please, my most high, hear my cry. You know what I'm going through, you know what you're gonna do. You heard my cry, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, I love you.